I'm on a mission to help the world to see success differently. We're sharing the stories of our guests. I hope to inspire those that listen. This is the Different Hats podcast produced by H2 Productions. I hope you can join us on this journey. your point of while you're playing I didn't really have a big fear of what I'm going to do after because I always when I went into football I thought you know if I can have two years playing mm. have two years off work and I'll go and work again mm. uh, and I was just fortunate it just sort of went on and on and on Bright Gale was the captain so he went to this pub and he go what do you want to drink and I sort of uh, orange and lemonade he went okay and orange and lemonade and 17 lagers. <laughs> Did that, went out for the night with the boys, trained the next day, uh, and then that was it. That was on the Wednesday. They said come up on the Monday. So I won the contract on the Monday and played played against Liverpool Reserves on the on the Monday night. Jamie wow. read that. John Barnes played. A completely different mindset of you've got to go in you've got to adapt and you've got to adapt quickly so, uh, but it was nuts yeah. I think of suddenly you watch match of the day and you're on it you're running a business in Brighton you've got to be the got to be the marketeer you've got to be the HR guy you've got to be the money guy yeah. you've got to be the sales guy yeah. uh, and you need support if you could pick out one highlight what would it be and why uh, probably so I went to a very posh private girls' school. I mean, actually, no, it was co ed to start with. Very posh, straw boaters. We played lacrosse, we did all this, but <laughs> with a twist. And then my dad just waltzes into the headmaster's office, pays for the school fees with the biggest wad of cash you've ever seen. And both of them made good money, we lost it. Made a bit more money, might have lost it, but that work ethic, it was all about work. That possibly was a problem. Mum, the shops are crap in North Lanes, but it's such a cool place. And um, she was like, oh, are you thinking something? I said, I'm thinking something. So she said, I'll come, I'll do it with you. Like, what? What? She said, yeah, I think I'm... I think I might leave your dad as well. I thought, oh, okay. Those three days, we were at, the first three days were absolutely packed. We'd sold the whole shop in three days. I was like, whoa. My thing, I always say to myself, this will pass. Because it will pass. And it does. In my life, you know, I've had some tough times. And, you know, I've had, my sister was ex- very, very seriously ill, life-threateningly ill. And so was one of my children. Um, thankfully both here to tell the tale and so the whole of last year I was really really quite sick I couldn't walk 500 meters um, I had chronic pain chronic fatigue um, could only work a few hours and being a single parent that was really tough I got divorced seven years ago and I was a complete mess and I couldn't function I mean we changed every single part of the business suppliers decor socials team training I did everything bit by bit I mean I even painted all the bloody walls on these enormous huge ceilings and bit by bit I did grow that business and you know it pretty exponentially in the first few years um, it's a completely different ball game now it's very yeah I'm really proud of it we do really well velvet has always been my happy place so throughout divorce or sickness or problems in the family I've always gone there I, thought, I love this I literally, I'm not joking, that velvet literally runs through my veins. I will be where I want to be with acting and I'll get into that later. And the only way it won't happen is if I quit or I die. And I'm not dying double digits, right? 100 and beyond, right? <laughs> and uh, and, uh, and I'm definitely not going to quit. So it's going to happen. You know, it's about being unavailable for any other option. But it is about having the belief, I think, and protecting it so much that you don't let anybody come in. And then this comes on to the big vision, which is powerful pictures. And this is what like keeps me up at night and is what fuels me in this powerful pictures being this production company that only makes true story films. That is it. Just true story movies, right? And uh, and when I think about that, like my heart is pounding out my chest and I'm like, you know what, I don't care if I have to wait another 10 years for that to happen, but it's gonna happen. When you say, Perry, you can't do that, my dad's face appears in my mind and I'm like, I'm like, fuck you, dad, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, fuck you, I am gonna do it. When it came to abuse, 
it was from my step granddad. Right, it's my nan's husband, so that would be my dad's stepdad. And I actually said the words that I used to enjoy it. And obviously now those have been tattooed in my brain. As a man, I enjoyed being sexually abused. So that obviously sparked depression. You know, half of my family are alcoholics, mm. or drug takers or whatever, lovely people, right? Mm. Um, but they've got their own traumas and, uh, and that's their coping mechanism. Mm. Uh, and I'm like, I could have just as easily gone down that road. Can you move, keep moving forward, keep moving forward, keep moving forward, be unavailable. My business partner said this once, he goes, I'm unavailable for any other option. If you could, if you could speak to your step one day now, today, what would you say to him? So if my dad, if my step granddad was alive now, I'd ask him. I was, I was very slow. Like I was very slow. I'd never driven before. My dad, I think he lapped me a few times, <laughs> but eventually he didn't lap me anymore. And then eventually I lapped him. Um, so obviously there was that progression there, but it was just the first time I drove a car, it, I just felt alive. Jessie Combs, who is a land speed record, she um, she passed away during an attempt, unfortunately, but she was a huge inspiration. But one of her quotes was, the steering wheel doesn't know I'm a woman. Men play with cars, girls play with Barbies. Like, you know, it's very, you are sort of pushed to your sort oh, of lane. And yeah. I don't think you should be. I think you should definitely find your own path and find what makes you happy. I Until I see a woman in F1, I'm not really going to be happy. Mm. And to be honest, the best life is a life well lived, a life authentically lived is yourself. Mentally, I've pretty much been at rock bottoms more times than I can count and more mm. times than I'd like to care to say. You know, there were times where I didn't want to be alive through what I've been through. And something just flipped in me sort of one day where I was like, well, if I'm going to make a go of it and I'm going to stay, mm. you've got to go for it. You've got to put everything into it. like. So when I was 15, I was sexually assaulted by a guy I met through racing. That, those periods where you thought, did, did you actually think about taking your own life? What, yeah, what is that? definitely. Really? There's probably more than one occasion. I, um, I just didn't want to be here. I, it, it was just awful. Mm. I felt like vulnerable. I felt picked apart. It, it was pretty much, there's nothing that anybody could probably do to me now that could ever make me feel bad again. I want people to know that even if you feel alone, you're not. You're not, because there are so many people who suffer in silence, and you shouldn't have to, because it was the first sort of time where I had, I knew I was good at driving, I knew like I had something about me, and I knew that I wanted to do it, but it was the first time I had proof. Try and find out where I was in the world sort of thing, but then I had all this issues of like, well, you're not really good enough to do this, you're not really good enough to do that. Uh, don't even bother trying to do this. That's, you know, whether it's a dream or not, uh, I wish now I could go back and talk to my former self and just say... What would you say? I would say uh, the dreams are what you make it. And if you're willing to put in the hard work, you will receive your dreams. And I remember getting called in and sitting down and we walked in and there was like six other people in that room it was like having our own entourage type thing and we were like this can't be good what stays for me because we hadn't done that much research and I, ha I had done a little bit and I said unfortunately there isn't a stage five and I can just remember thinking my little boy was four at the time that I'm not going to make it to his fifth birthday we were given a card by Macmillan with a phone number on uh, and we just left the hospital with no focus, no goal, no direction, no idea of what to do next. I believe that like, I took responsibility for putting myself in that stage four advanced incurable cancer category. Uh, that was me who got myself there. So I take full responsibility for my own cancer. Can you almost still pinpoint, I guess, that a point where you was like, that, that has got to be another answer? Or what, what was your next steps, I guess, after that initial phase? It was, uh, the, the one turning point was um, when we went to pick our little boy up from school. And, sorry, <laughs> me and my wife just stood there and looked at our little boy and went, we are going to fight this to the death. When my parents were leaving, my, they were saying goodbye to me. And father said to me, "You're responsible for your brother now. You need at to take years old. at eleven. You need to take care of him." I felt abandoned, mm. but at the same time, I had a job to do. 
And so I focused on that. So I became a campaigner in turn. I stood on a soapbox at Hyde Park Corner. I went on marches. You know, I was part of the women's liberation movement later. What we get in our growing up has been handed down generation after generation after generation, and we haven't questioned it. I found myself homeless, sitting on my suitcase, eight and a half months pregnant, thinking, well, what do I do now? I cannot get my head around why we have to differentiate between sexes, between genders, between colours, between cultures, between behaviours. We're all human beings. My temperament, you know, is, well, nothing's impossible. It's just a matter of choice. I've been clear of my purpose for many, many years, and that has guided me beautifully, for the most part. We all want to matter in some way or another, and so we should, because we need community, we need support, we need to share, we need the love, we need the kindness, we need the peace, for heaven's sake. Financial education, relationship building, dealing with limiting beliefs, managing changes. I mean, that's just a few things we could do. Failure is a gift. Failure is how we learn. Failure is an education. How do you define success? How do I define, define success? success? Okay. So success is what you say it is. And a third element of success for me is integrity. You know, I was reasonably um, successful through, through school um, uh, and knew that I wanted to have a career that would stretch me and challenge me. Um, although law wasn't on the agenda. It's when you find that thing. You know, we often use those phrases, it, it, it's not work. But it, it gives you the energy to get up in the morning, to keep going when things are tough. And, and things do get tough at times. So you have to have that sort of underlying passion for what you do. Understanding that life requires an element of fortitude and resilience. Um, it's not going to be perfect. The whole group was, was breaking up. Um, at that point in time, I was a director of the UK business. And I felt that um, there was value in the business beyond the sort of financial elements. And it just told me, I think, that it's not always the easy path that is the best. Just being able to bring people together and say, look, you know, we've got a forum here. It's informal. It's a small community. Yeah. But we think you two would get on well. We think you've got some joint interests, or maybe there's an opportunity to do some business. And without any other agenda, doing it because it's the right thing to do. I've taken through my career. Yeah. It, it actually, there is really a no substitute for hard work. Mm. To achieve something, um, you, you've, one, individually got to work hard, but also get yourself in a, in a band of sisters and brothers who are prepared to work hard with you as well. Then, then you can really achieve some great things. He said, of integrity, um, it's doing the right thing even when no one's watching. Uh, school was not a pleasure for, for me. Uh, oh, my, my father, um, because of his success, he, he was able to put his four kids through private school and, and I hated every second of it. Uh, it was actually the woodwork teacher, uh, which I thought was quite ironic, but he actually, uh, I remember him shouting at me in a lesson saying, um, don't know how your father can afford to send you here when he's only a baker. So I always judge people um, on, on that instinct, that gut feel, uh, and, it, and it doesn't let me down. And then I took the leap of faith and, and stepped out onto my own, um, and that's a whole new thing. Um, initially, when I set up on my own, I was just um, buying and, and, and trading land. Um, that and it, it was a, a, an amazingly uh, profitable uh, business. Um, until the banking crisis where suddenly <laughs> everything stopped. What I hated about trading land was this lifestyle of feast famine. You know, I could literally have obscene amounts of money in my current account and two years later you could be thinking, how on earth am I gonna feed the kids and pay the mortgage? I, I have never had a planning application where I've had nothing but support from the locals. You may get the occasional little tiny percentage, but predominantly it's, uh, they, they resent you, they hate you. I've, I've had physical violence, I've been spat at, sworn at, hate campaigns, you name it. 
Wow. And, and that was the creation of Devasys because I realized that the British public hated development. So you've got to be certain that when you get that plan, you will get a planning permission and you will then be able to turn that to, to profit. So there is a huge amount of risk in, in, in development and, and you see failure as a learning opportunity. You'll, you'll learn more from failure than you will from success. I used to have this very simple rule. If it makes a difference to my business, I will do it. If it doesn't, I won't. I would literally just focus on what would make a difference to the business. What can I do today that moves me forward? Success, I suppose, bedtime. At the end of each day, have I made a difference? And I had a fantastic, you know, fantastic childhood. We didn't have much, um, you know, maybe compared to other people, but that mattered not a jot. You know, we just had a really happy, loving childhood. My level results weren't the best. I think I got a D and a, uh, E in maths and whatever. But I took economics for the first time, found it the easiest thing in the world, realised I had a kind of affinity with economics and you know, stormed it with an A and absolutely loved it. Found it so interesting, um, business in general. When I started the business, I started with absolutely nothing. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of tracking back on, so I'll maybe come to that, but it was that yeah. kind of drive of starting with nothing and thinking, how am I going to pay my bills this week? Try and have that plan and try and be ahead of the game. You know, try and say, okay, I'm someone that has never wanted to stand still. I've always wanted to be at that next level. Now, if, you look, if you're on your deathbed looking back, have you done you know, all the things you can do to be the true you? Is that the true Richard Skerritt looking back on his life going, that was a good, you know, I had a good run. I'm enormously proud that my business that I started in my, um, my, sp in my, my spare room, it was my shared room, you know, <laughs> with some ex-kind of polytechnic dads, and uh, that's where we started. So to see that happen is just really, really satisfying. Was it success is built in the hard times, failure is built in the good times. Yeah. I'll be happy when, I'll be happy when, I'll be happy when I get the new car or the new house or the new whatever, when that happens. And it's such a shame and we're all guilty of it. Yeah. Now thinking that something in the future is going to make us happier when we should look at ourselves and you know what, everything's great now. I remember going back when times are hard, I remember one of my measures of success, I had a... I had a Ford Escort, cost me 150 quid mm. at the time. It had been in three, it'd been written off three times by insurance companies, mm. four different colour panels, whatever. The first time I went in there, I could fill the petrol tank up and be confident my car would work. I honestly, to this day, I'll never forget treating that as you know what's scary, you're doing okay. Define success, you know, I wouldn't say you were successful in terms of that, from you know, as a human being, monetary wise, business wise. But to be successful as a human being, you have to be happy, you have to be. Yeah, reach that self actualization Leaving Brighton was was probably one of the saddest moments in in my career. My dad focused just in, on my education. It's like values, uh, integrity, and football is it would be a consequence of that. Everything is a is a consequence of a uh, your effort, your attitude, yeah. your mentality. Everything came with a uh, responsibility. Yeah? I think we spoke, we spoke about that um, and it was about, you know, I mean, I was really young age and I said to my dad, um, I wanted to be the best footballer in the world. And he, and he said, okay, like, then you know what it takes. We're living in this world right now that everything has to be towards the outside instead of towards the inside. Then it's like we're taking decisions not based on what we want to do. We're taking decisions based on how it looks outside. We cannot lie, yeah? it's like life, there is suffering in life, mm. like all of us, uh, in different levels. Um, and in my career I had suffering and I had difficult moments, like ups and downs. <laughs> we don't control what happens to us, we just control how we respond to it. Yeah. Last times it was my last year in, uh, when I was playing for Valencia, for example, is, is, is I was injured, I came back, I wasn't playing as much, um, and I got into a like dark place. Um, I healed human being, fixed human being, is much more beautiful than a human being who never suffered. Why people remember you is, is because how you make them feel. I don't remember the parade here in, in Brighton, for example, it's like, like, I've got goosebumps, you know what I mean? It's like, there is a moment in my, in my career that I felt in peace, that it was my last game for Brighton. And the sadness is there. The sadness is there. But as we said earlier, life is about suffering. Life is about leaning forward. Lean forward. Lean forward. And that's how I felt. Yeah.
So she called me into a meeting and she said, Joe, I'm really sorry, but you're about to lose everything. The, the key thing was to finish, finish my education. And I think that's why it was so hard for them when I was then pregnant, when I was 16. It, it was not planned consciously, but I would say that I was definitely struggling at that time with my mental health, just by virtue of the fact that I was a teenager and full of hormones. And of course, when I then became pregnant, there was absolutely no doubt in my mind ever that I would be keeping my baby. The ability to form relationships and solve problems, the ability to collaborate, there are so many skills that are so much more valuable in the world today than just having a, a piece of paper that says you're clever. So I've been a parent my entire adult life. I was pregnant before I left home and I've always had to combine work with family. Yeah, so when I was 18, my son's dad killed himself. No, he, he took his own life. He gassed himself in my car. But from that moment onwards, I realized that people and relationships and um, being happy is so much more important than working hard and doing well. So fast forward to 2018, um, that was actually the year that I was homeschooling the kids. Um, unfortunately, that was also the year that my marriage broke down. But saying no meant losing everything and saying yes meant maybe saving everything. So I said yes. And I took, actually, in a relatively short period of time, the business was thriving. You know, it was doing well, it was making a good profit and we were climbing our way out of that big black hole that we'd, that we'd been in. I can't say you enjoyed those early bits because the survival was, you know, sometimes it was mum and I hugging each other crying at you know, 11 o'clock at night because we didn't know how we were going to pay the bill the next day. We all sort of said, well, listen, you're not, going to, you're not going to survive our rules or do any of our academia, so you better move on. So, yeah, I was expelled at, uh, at 17. And uh, that, that's when I moved down to everybody's horror, back down to Sussex, moved back in with my mother and said I was going to become a cabinet maker. And uh, I said, no, 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 it's not for me. You know, I've tried. I've failed and I need to be in control of my destiny. I, I knew somewhere deep down that I just, just had to start from scratch and do something myself because measuring the success took a long time. I mean, it was such a long struggle. I mean, it was like a, like a jumbo jet taking off. There was a lot of concern because that was really, really tough. You know, those early days, just short of money, um, borrowed from friends and family. It was... I couldn't see the success as much as the fear of failure. I, I think I think that's another recurring thought that I just remember that turns around in the back of that mind somewhere. Um, it was the fear of failure. I am not going to fail. Yeah. It was emotionally shattering. Really? Oh, cry my eyes out. Really? Absolutely, cry my eyes out. You know, on the one hand, I took a screenshot of the bank balance, which I sent to Mum, um, and uh, but on the other hand. It was just, I don't know whether it was all those pent up years of pain, you know, to get to, uh, what success? You do have your dancing on the ceiling moment, there's no doubt about that. Um, but also you realize what's important in life. I couldn't stand by and let my, my club, you know, my team that I'd supported since I was eight years of age, get destroyed by this, in, you know, this nasty bit of work northern businessman uh, amazing that i was 50 years a fan before i came uh, became chairman but i never expected to become chairman and that's one of the lessons i i learned early on which is in my business which is to, is surround yourself with good people you can't do it on your own you know for me it, it's all about determination enthusiasm for the job you know, for what you're doing. If you also had a will to win, I mean, I brought all that stuff into football. Then the bad, dark days hit the Albion. You know, uh, the Archer and Bellotti and, and uh, Stanley. What yeah. made you get in at that time? Come April 96, sadly, my dear wife Margie had died in October, the previous October. And um, Liam approached me again and said, it's now or never. I couldn't stand by and, and see my club 
being destroyed by this guy who had no genuine interest in the club at all. He had the potential to be a big club, and now we're fulfilling that. <sighs> Education. I've got a, I've got a, I've got a feeling and a theory with this, which is that, um, that what education fails to do. For a while I worked for this FTSE 100 company and um, and I, I, the best way I've come to describe it as an organisation these days is like it's a successful company full of unsuccessful people. And then like four or five years go by and they go, you know, and they've got to get their promotion, they've got to get their pay rise, they've got to get their slightly smarter suit, they've got to get the slightly bigger house, they've got to get the slightly fancier new, new car. Like, it's like, and it's like the the predictable scaffolding of life, you know, particularly as a successful person in a successful business. But I fucking hate those guys that are like, I'll do anything for my kids. And it's like, well, would you go part time and take a 30K pay cut? I didn't mean anything. Like my life is chaos. It will probably become more chaotic rather than less as time goes by. But I always know I'm going to be a patient, present parent. Like me and my business partner, we have this kind of phrase, which is like, what's the path of least regret? You look at all of these sort of successes and it's like, okay, so what are the consistent behaviors that allow those successes to happen? Mm. And if you can start to unpick that and start to articulate it, all of a sudden, very honest and authentic values for people and teams can appear. But for me, it all comes down to behavior, like behavior and questions like are the, are the, are the driving force of the things that get us wherever wherever we're going. And she always used to say, Jacob, don't you know that less is more? And then and he said, I'll, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll never forget what I said to her. I turned around to her and said, yes, but in order to experience, in order to know what less is, you need to experience more first. And this is always a very unpopular opinion or not or a very unpopular thing for people to hear, I suppose. But the, the, the people that I'm least interested in working with are the people. That... It's a defining moment for me because um, it was a, it was the day that I became who I wanted to be. I was brought up in quite humble beginnings, a uh, council estate um, in Brighton. I didn't know my dad for the first 25 years of my life probably especially my nan, taught me how to bake at a very young age. So it was in the heart and the blood. So my mum married and my stepfather was quite abusive. So I had quite a difficult childhood after that. Mm. When I was about sort of 10 or 11, I immersed myself in baking. And that was my kind of escape, really. Mm. Food was, is always a part of my reason for being, really. It's in my DNA. We got to a point where I had a, a breakdown. Um, it was the 10th of October, 2010. You always know the exact date when you are taken into hospital for my mum said to me you need to change your life and I said I want to start a little bakery I just want to go back to basics nice little cottage industry go and just bake that's all I want to do so that's where Piglet's Pantry was formed what I would say is it's also given me strength and courage and the ability to always kind of look at things and think there's, there is a worst outcome, we've been there. <laughs> Nothing gets worse than trying to take your own life. That's pretty traumatic. But I try and go for a swim or do something for myself every single day, whether that's walking along the seafront with a nice hot cup of chocolate and just looking at the world and thinking how great it is to see the sea, it's stormy day or whatever it might be. It's just giving yourself that kind of permission to, to stop and breathe and just, you know, go, life's not that bad really, is it? Now I live and breathe it every day, so um, I get to do what I love every single day, which is, you know, I think the gift I gave myself 13 mm -hmm. years ago. I love what I do. I love getting up every morning. I love creating new products. I love having a brief that comes on my door that nobody else can do and we achieve it. Um, it's certainly not for the money, absolutely not. See failure as a stepping stone to the success you're going to be. I think I realised from quite an early age that, you know, life is short. It can be ended pretty swiftly, you know, badly. Um, you're a long time dead. Um, it was that moment that actually changed my life, gave me a focus and allowed me the, the opportunity to dream big and, you know, to set my sights on something quite challenging, which was to become a, an officer in the Royal Marines. My junior school headmaster told me to my face that he didn't think I would pass a single GCSE exam. It's, it's about uh, coming up with a good idea, attacking it with energy and enthusiasm. Mm. And, um, you know, occasionally you have to show a little bit of resourcefulness and, and resilience to, to get through it. But it starts with curiosity and then um, being brave enough to go, oh, I'll give that a go and not be worried about fear of failure and really enjoying it. Um, 
my time in the Marines and then all of a sudden my dad contracted cancer and then had a, a slow, uh, miserable, um, painful death, which kind of really affected me. I, I lost a bit of self-confidence at that, at that moment. Uh, I was definitely down and a little depressed. Um, and it was uh, spotted and noticed. And then the worst thing happened really for me. I had to hand all the, all the, uh, the sword back and the, and, the, and the uniform back and my dream had been crushed, you know, and, and it, it, was a, it was a tough time. And I thought, sod that. Um, I'm not, uh, after those three consecutive failures uh, as an employee, P-A-Y-E, I thought, sod it, I'm not going to rely on anybody else. They could give us a three million pound contract because we'd done 10 million quid's worth of work for Rolls-Royce um, off the back of that failure. And then, you know, essentially before you knew it, we were turning over 30, then 35, then 40 million pounds. If two of us, a partnership, what, what could you do? We, we were loggerheads. I wanted to take the business to 100 million. He wanted to sell and, and go on holiday to Spain. So we ended up agreeing on the flip of a coin what strategy we'd, we'd follow. And unfortunately, I try not to have regrets, Sam. You know, I, you know, you make decisions, things happen. And, you know, as long as you face life with, with enthusiasm and with energy and optimism and passion and, and, and love and, and kindness, then what, what else actually do you need? You know, success is, it shouldn't be measured in, in, in numbers. It shouldn't be measured in uh, figures and status and ego. It should just be for everybody, every individual. It should be things like uh, fulfillment, uh, contentment, happiness, love, peace.